Welcome to the next installment of the Miami Group Sierra Club Virtual Backpack Series. Welcome everyone. Uh, Going to get into the topic for the evening, which is trailside gourmet or dehydrating for backpackers. Um, Going to start though with some introductions. So my name is Barry Randall, uh, otherwise known as Aardvark. And I'm the Sierra Club Miami Group outing chair in the camping, hiking, backpacking for many, many years. Um, Denise, you want to introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, my name is Denise Tingle, or my trail name is Tippy Long Stockings because I wear braids and have long hair when I'm backpacking. And I've been camping, hiking, backpacking for about 45 plus years. I am the hiking chair leader for the Miami Group Sierra Club, along with an instructor for the backpacking school. In addition, I lead cycling rides and backpacking trips, and my passion is backpacking and cycling, and I just love anything in the outdoors. We also have Nancy Ball, uh, some of Check and Travel, and we also have Brian Wolf, who is also our uh, backpacking school instructor, and unfortunately, they weren't able to join tonight, but they usually are here. So welcome, everyone, and now Barry will start the presentation. Okay. Thanks, Denise. So we're going to start off with a, a little poll here or quiz that uh, basically the um, question is, is dehydrating something that's probably going to fit your needs? So um, go ahead and uh, select as many of these things as think you think apply to you. You know, do you, do you enjoy experimenting with, with food and flavors? Um, do you sometimes think about those commercial freeze-dried meals, you know, Mountain House, et cetera, as being pretty expensive? Um, do you not mind spending some time prepping your meals? Uh, do you like the idea that you can actually directly control all of the ingredients in your meals? And are you someone who's maybe concerned about pack weight and it always seems like your, your food's pretty heavy? So go ahead again and just select all of those that apply to you. I'll give you another minute or two and then I'll go ahead and uh, share the results. Looks like we're about there at 95%. So I'll just go ahead and end the polling. Okay. Share the so, results. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's no right or wrong answers here, but probably the more of these statements that you agree with, probably the more benefits you're going to get out of dehydrating your own food and, and frankly, the more, uh, the more you're going to enjoy it. Uh, so let me get out of this here. Okay. So the first thing we're going to talk about uh, tonight and, and again, just as a reminder, if you have questions along the way, please type them in the chat box and uh, we'll stop periodically and, and take a look at those. So first thing we're gonna talk about is the dehydrator themselves. So um, you can certainly dehydrate or play around with dehydrating without actually buying a dehydrator, right? You can set your oven on low and you can do some very basic things. But if you get serious about this, then a dehydrator, uh, is certainly a, a sound investment. So some of the features that they're gonna have are the temperature control, so the temperature range. Um, the lower temperatures, you know, 100 and below or for more fragile things like herbs and spinach and that kind of stuff. Higher temperatures, you know, 160 above are gonna be for meats and jerky and, and that sort of thing. Uh, these days, they almost all come with a programmable timer um, that allows you to set it up and have it shut off in the middle of the night or whenever you need it to, because typically you're going to be dehydrating for you know 10 to 12 hours. So that's a handy feature. Uh, you want to take a look at the size and shape. They, they basically come in the square boxy kind and the cylinder kind. Um, some of them advertise themselves as being really quiet. Um, they're, they're not super noisy. It's like maybe a kitchen fan kind of noise level. Um, basic capability, uh, the drying power, the wattage is something that you might want to take a look at. It usually runs between 300 and 1,000 watts. They'll, they'll 
describe specs for different fan sizes and fan speeds that you know recirculate uh, the air. Some of them actually don't even have fans. Uh, some of the really lower priced ones. And then you want to look at the capacity and, and whether or not it's expandable or not. Um, some of those pictured here, the, the kind of square ones, they have fixed trays that kind of slide in and out. So that's pretty much as, as large as they get or the capacity. Others, you can kind of add capacity like that Nesco in the middle where you can kind of stack up the trays. And the cost, like many things, you can spend uh, a lot of money or a little money on this. Um, there are actually some that are less than $75. Uh, I'm not sure I would recommend those, uh, but you can spend 300 plus dollars on a dehydrator. So uh, again, I'm gonna stop sharing here and just take a quick look at uh, dehydrator that I use here. Um, if you go into a uh, speaker mode, by the way, you'll get uh, the picture of the speaker or this dehydrator large on your screen. So the brand of this one's an open country. It's a pretty stripped down, basic, low cost brand. Um, I've had this for like 15, 20 years. Um, it doesn't have many bells and whistles, but on the other hand, it seems to work pretty good. So I, I used it and uh, have good success with it. So the top part here is the, the fan and, and heating part. And then this is the kind that uh, is stackable. So you can actually buy additional uh, trays and kind of stack this up and expand your capacity that way. Um, they typically come with a couple of different kinds of inserts or you can buy these separately. Um, this kind of insert is what you would use for chunks of like meat or vegetables or fruits, things that are kind of chunky. And then the other uh, kind of insert that's pretty common is for more liquid kinds of things. It's a tray that looks something like that, that you would use for like fruit leathers or sauces or something like that. So, so that's pretty basic. Uh, again, this, is, this would have been a lower cost one, probably in the $75 range, although that was a long time ago. Um, so let me uh, jump back into the presentation here. Oh. Okay. So I also want to just mention the, the different cooking options on the trail, uh, mainly because this will kind of come up as we talk about the different kinds of foods and dehydrating. Uh, because uh, some foods de rehydrate very easily, others uh, don't. And there's two basic ways of uh, cooking dehydrated meals on the trail. The first is freezer bag. And just think of that as kind of a homemade mountain house meal. So basically you take whatever you have, you're just adding boiling water, you let it sit for 10 or 15 minutes, um, and then you eat it just like you would, again, a mountain house meal or one of the freeze dried meals. Um, and if you're using that style of cooking, you wanna make sure that the dehydrated foods that you're using are those that rehydrate pretty easily, uh, like ground meats, which we'll talk about in a bit, uh, rice, pasta, uh, sauces, things that are gonna rehydrate pretty easily. Um, the other method, which allows you to rehydrate the meal for any length of time before you heat it up is the in the pot method. So you basically add water to the meal, let it rehydrate as long as it needs. Um, pretty much five minutes is probably the absolute minimum. Um, then you put it in the pot or if it's already in the pot rehydrating, that's fine. You bring it to a boil for a minute, you turn off your stove and you let it sit for 10 to 15 minutes. Um, the the advantage of this approach is that, again, you can rehydrate the meal for as long as you need. Uh, There's some meals that I do that as soon as I get to camp, I'll actually add water to the um, bag that I have the, the meal in, and I'll let it just rehydrate while I'm setting up my tent, while I'm doing a bear hang, while I'm getting firewood, all that kind of stuff. So it might be easily an hour 
before uh, I actually start cooking. So that's a, that's a lot of time that that food can now rehydrate. So some foods are more amenable to that, okay? The different types of foods that uh, you can rehydrate, um, you have fruits, vegetables, meats, eggs, sauces, pasta rice, or doing a whole meal all together. And we'll, we'll talk about um, each one of those uh, in a little, little more depth there. Okay, so let's start out with fruits. Um, if you're doing uh, chunks of fruit, you wanna slice them into about an eighth of an inch pieces. Uh, the other really popular thing to do is to puree the fruit and make it into a leather, fruit leather. Uh, it's very similar to the fruit leathers you buy in the store, except they usually taste a whole lot better. Uh, if, if some fruits, and actually you can do this with uh, any fruit that you want, um, actually uh, work best if you add a base to it, and that would be something like um, applesauce. So you can, you can take applesauce, add in almost any kind of fruit, puree it, and uh, that makes a nice combination too if you just don't wanna do pure, pure um, you know, uh, peaches or whatever, okay? And all of those things listed there are good things to, uh, they, they all dehydrate well and they all rehydrate well. And as we go along here, I've just got some sample recipes that I also include here and a reference, and we'll include the references at the back as to how to actually find these recipes. But this is using some peaches to do a, a hot peach crumble dessert, which is actually very good. Okay, so that's fruits. Yeah. Go on to vegetables here. So for vegetables, um, you can do fresh, you can do canned, you can do frozen. Um, if it's something that you would normally eat raw, like put it on a salad, like uh, mushrooms or uh, uh, something like that, um, you, you don't have to cook it before you um, dehydrate it. If it's something that you normally wouldn't eat raw, so peas, corn, I don't know, green beans, potatoes, those kinds of things, obviously you wanna cook it before you dehydrate it. Um, if you're uh, if you're using raw uh, vegetables or uh, frozen vegetables, I do this as well. Uh, you might want to steam it or microwave it um, for a little bit if you're going to use it. Particularly if you're going to use it in a freezer bag meal. So if it's something that you're just going to add hot water to, um, if you steam it first and then dehydrate it, it'll actually rehydrate uh, quite a bit better. And uh, these are all good examples, uh, peppers, onions, tomatoes, um, mushrooms, carrots, green beans, canned beans, spinach, uh, white potatoes. Obviously you can buy dehydrated white potatoes in the store, so you don't really have to make your own, but you can. Uh, sweet potatoes are a little hard to find in the store, already uh, you know dehydrated, but dehydrated sweet potatoes are actually excellent. Uh, zucchini, basically anything that you can think of. Uh, and the, the example recipe there is a chickpea and vegetable curry um, that's uh, off of one of the websites we'll give you a, a reference to that's um, called Trail Recipes, okay? So that's vegetables. Uh, talk a little bit about meats. Um, meats can get uh, a little bit complicated. Um, Lean meats are best. Uh, fats do not dehydrate. They just kind of sit there. So whatever fat is in a particular food is just still gonna be there after you dehydrate it. So if you're gonna dehydrate meat, look for a lean cut. Uh, jerky obviously is very popular for snacks and that sort of thing, and you can make jerky, but jerky does not rehydrate. I mean, it just doesn't. So if you want it for a snack or for lunch or something, that's great. But as far as putting it into a meal, um, I, I don't find it very, very good. It's, it just never gets soft. Um, ground meats though work very well. So ground beef, ground chicken, ground turkey. 
Um, the trick is um, to add breadcrumbs to it, almost like you were making a meatloaf, but without egg or anything like that. But add breadcrumbs to it, and then you cook it, you know, fry it uh, until it's little chunks, cooked chunks, and then you dehydrate it. And the breadcrumbs will facilitate the rehydration. So if you're doing, particularly if you're doing a freezer bag meal where you're just adding hot water, uh, I highly recommend doing ground meats and, and using this technique. Um, you can also use it for uh, fattier meats like uh, sausage and chorizo. Just be aware that you need to try and get as much of that fat out of there uh, as you can, both by draining it. And I actually, when I do like chorizo, which is one of my, my favorite things to do, I ended up having to blot it a lot, you know, after it's cooked to try and get some of that fat off of there before I dehydrate it. Um, you can do uh, shredded meats, uh, so like cook fresh chicken and shred it. Uh, you can do canned meats, which, you know, basically shredded and shred them up, uh, but they will require a little bit more longer rehydration time. So those are really best for the cook in the pot kind of meal because you can rehydrate them longer before you heat them up. Um, I've read many times that uh, canned meats actually uh, dehydrate and rehydrate better because they're cooked under pressure in the can. I personally haven't found that much difference in um, how it, how they work, uh, but you know, it's something to try. So you can do seafood too. You can do tuna, you can do shrimp, you can do any of that kind of stuff. Um, and the, uh, what we're showing here in this picture is a, uh, it's actually a breakfast taco and we'll actually show a little video hopefully at the end here that shows you how to make those. Okay, so that's meats. Um, Let's take a quick pause here for uh, any questions. All right, let's see, where are we? We're up to uh, pasta and rice. So uh, my initial reaction when, the fir when I first read about dehydrating pasta was, why on earth would you want to or need to dehydrate pasta? It's already dry, it's already lightweight. Um, but then I actually, you know, the brain clicked in and I realized that uh, even though it's dry, it's not cooked. So anyone who cooks pasta rice knows that uh, one, it, it takes a lot of water. Typically, if you're cooking pasta, you're putting in like a quart of water, or a couple of quarts of water, and bringing it to a boil. You're usually boiling it for like eight minutes or so. And then, uh, then you're pouring off all that water. So if you're doing that while you're backpacking, uh, you're one, taking a lot of time, but two, you're taking an awful lot of water and it ends up water with food residue in it that you have to figure out how to responsibly get rid of at your campsite. Um, and it takes a lot of fuel, right? Keeping something in a rolling boil for eight minutes takes a lot of fuel. So um, dehydrating pasta and rice is absolutely worth the effort uh, because then it's cooked, but it's dried and you can actually just add hot water to it and it uh, it's actually very good. Um, ramen and minute rice are two examples of cooked dehydrated um, pasta and rice that you can just buy at a grocery store. So even if you don't get into dehydrating, you know, those are actually great items to just use in a freezer bag kind of meal. Uh, but if you want to do, you know, penne or spaghetti or whatever your favorite pasta is, or if uh, you want to do wild rice or long grain rice instead of minute rice, if you're a little pickier about your rice, you can, you can cook it and dehydrate it yourself. And uh, when I do the pasta, I, I do it kind of al dente, um, and that seems to rehydrate well on the trail. And this recipe uh, actually comes off a website called Backpacking Chef. Again, we'll have a reference to that uh, at the end of the presentation, but this is a uh, called Kickin' Veggie Mac and Cheese. And uh, again, that's, that's a pretty good recipe. 
So let's keep going here. So the next item we want to talk about is, uh, oops, sorry, is uh, sauces and salsas. So um, you can do pretty much any kind of um, sauce that you want, you know, homemade sauce, like spaghetti sauce or something from a jar. I usually, I'm kind of lazy about this, so I usually use a jar of sauce. Um, and it dehydrates into kind of a leather. Uh, you do want to avoid cheesy sauces. It's a lot better to add some kind of powdered cheese uh, with the meal later than it is to try and dehydrate uh, cheesy sauces. Because again, fat doesn't dehydrate, so it'll just kind of be there. Um, I, I don't think I mentioned it before, but the reason you want to avoid fat is that uh, it does shorten the uh, storage time of dehydrated food. So if there's fat involved, the food tends to turn rancid. Um, so you can avoid that by trying to minimize the amount of fat. So you can uh, either store it as leather, like a fruit leather or something like that. Uh, or if you want it to rehydrate faster, you can grind up um, really anything that's kind of started out as a liquid. Um, I dehydrate yogurt, for example. And you can either keep it as yogurt leather or I'll grind it up and I'll add yogurt powder to like oatmeal or to um, fruits if I'm rehydrating some fruits for uh, breakfast or something. So anything that kind of started out as a liquid that you want to grind up that would make it rehydrate faster, you can do that. Uh, just a tip, it, it works a little better if you freeze the leather first before you grind it. And uh, I've found that the um, magic bullet style of blenders, and those are the ones that you make a personal smoothie in, if you're familiar with that. Um, those with a coffee grinder blade, they usually come with several different blades and the coffee grinder blade in that, uh, I find works best because in some regular blenders, the, the food tends to kind of gunk up at the bottom around the blade. And, uh, this style blender seems to work really well. So, okay. All right. Eggs. Um, so eggs are one of actually one of the more challenging uh, foods to try and deal with uh, dehydrating and on the trail. Um, simply cooking the eggs and dehydrating them just plain doesn't work. So you end up with this really hard egg thing. Like if you take scrambled eggs and just dehydrate, you end up with this little like pebble that absolutely doesn't rehydrate, just turns into kind of a gritty mush. Um, doesn't work at all. Now you can uh, dehydrate uh, raw eggs. Um, you can dehydrate them and you grind them up. And the, the only caveat there is they're raw eggs. So you absolutely have to cook them on the trail. Uh, because of salmonella or whatever that is that raw eggs have in them. Um, you can buy dehydrated eggs too. I mean, many, almost any of these foods that we're talking about, you can buy dehydrated. So you can buy dehydrated eggs, but it's honestly not that difficult to dehydrate raw eggs. Um, the alternative, the, the only effective alternative that I've been able to find is sort of this scrambled eggs uh, with polenta. If you're not familiar with polenta, it's uh, kind of a fine grits and it, it conveniently has this nice golden color to it, very similar to eggs. Uh, and basically what you do is you take cooked polenta, you mix it in with the eggs and you bake it. And once it's baked, you break it up into little chunks that as you can see in the picture there at the bottom, look very much like little chunks of scrambled eggs. And what that polenta does, it serves the same purpose as the breadcrumbs in the uh, ground meats. It just allows the uh, egg to rehydrate much better because uh, the polenta will reabsorb the water. So you can actually use these eggs in a freezer bag meal. 
So you can make like breakfast tacos or basically scrambled eggs just by adding hot water uh, to a, a bag full of these. So that works works pretty well. And uh, actually, let me uh, let me drop out of this for a second again and just actually show you a couple of examples here. Uh, show you what those eggs look like. So hopefully you can see that. Um, they basically are just little chunks, right? Kind of looks like egg. Uh, and it actually tastes like kind of a combination of eggs and grits, which is really what plant is. Uh, these have kind of a white powder on it. That's actually nido which is a dehydrated milk, um, as I actually put these together for a specific meal that I was taking on a trip. So that's kind of what, the, what those eggs look like. Um, while I've got you here, I'll also show you what the uh, ground meat looks like. Um, this is some of the ground turkey. You can see it ends up in basically little hard chunks um, but they rehydrate really well, about 10 minutes uh, in hot water. That'll be soft and it tastes like turkey. So those are a couple of examples. Um, we'll maybe show you a few more a little bit later, but let's get on back to presentation. Okay, so there's a, a couple of different ways to construct meals if you're into dehydrating food. So one approach is to dehydrate every ingredient individually and then either following a recipe or just using your imagination, constructing a meal and taking those, you know, four or five ingredients with you and mixing them together on the trail and adding hot water or cooking it. Um, if you look at uh, these columns here, I, I've found that a lot of recipes kind of have one or two items from each of these columns. So there's usually some kind of base or carb involved, you know, a pasta or rice or ramen or whatever. Usually there's some kind of protein, some kind of meat or beans or eggs or something like that that's uh, in the meal, assuming it's not vegetarian. Usually there's some veggies or some fruit in there, give it a little flavor, some color. And then often there's a sauce of some kind or just plain spices, almost any kind of spice, right? So if you, if you go through these columns and you were to pick one from each one, you could construct any kind of meal you want. You could um, construct a beefy um, mac and cheese out of this. Um, you could, construct uh, a Spanish rice meal out of these. Um, so this is one approach is dehydrate everything separately and then reconstruct a meal uh, as you want when you're getting ready to get, head out on the trail. The other thing to notice on this, li this list is not everything on here is something you dehydrate yourself, right? There's quite a few items on here that are just stuff that you can just buy in the grocery store and it's already pre-cooked, dehydrated in some fashion. So things like instant potatoes, hash browns, uh, stuffing mix, uh, instant oatmeal, instant grits, you know, you don't have to make those yourself if you don't want to, you can just, you can just buy them. Um, pre-cooked bacon, that's a great one. You know, nuts is a great source of protein. A um, little harder to find uh, veggies, but you can certainly get dehydrated uh, fruit um, be a little cautious. I mean, they when dehydrate uh, fruit like bananas and stuff, they don't just dehydrate it. Bananas are a good example because they're actually fried. Um, and then as far as sauces, you know, obviously any kind of spice is fair game. I mentioned nido before. If you are going to need milk, um, nido is uh, probably the best option out there because it uh, actually has some fat content which is ironic is, you know, we try not to carry things with fat, but it actually tastes like milk because of that. 
um, and dried and powdered cheeses or something too. That you can you can buy those uh, pretty easily. So again, that's that approach to constructing a meal. Uh, Barry, we do yeah. have one question for you. How do you keep track of your serving size after you dehydrate it? Since you're talking about that, um, that's actually a great great point. Um, most of the recipes um, that I follow, and again, we'll give you some re references here. We'll kind of walk you through, um, they'll say like a third of a cup of your protein of like meat. They'll tell you a cup of uh, pasta and they'll, they'll kind of tell you how to, how much of each of these to put in. Um, the one, one place where I kind of have to keep track of it myself is when I'm doing like a spaghetti sauce or something um, I try and keep track of um, if I'm putting a jar of sauce and let's say it fills up two trays, a jar of spaghetti sauce is probably like four servings. So that tells me that half of a tray is when it's dehydrated is one serving of pasta sauce. So sometimes you kind of have to keep track of it yourself. Uh, but a lot of the recipes that uh, are out there and available, they will give you a recommended portion size. Uh, in fact, uh, let me, since you asked the question right now, let me jump back over here and just show you an example. Uh, did I? Okay. So, this is some spaghetti sauce that I did. And this is one jar of spaghetti sauce. And what I have in this bag is actually four individual bags, right? Each one is one fourth of that jar. It took two trays to dehydrate that jar. So each of these is half of one of those trays. And if you actually open this up, you can see it has that kind of leather. It's almost like a fruit leather kind of consistency to it. But if I were to unfold that all the way, you can see it's, it's half of one of those trays. So I know that that's a fourth of a jar. So that's, that's one way to kind of keep track of what you're doing. Um, in other cases, it gets a little bit dicey. Um, for example, this is this is a frozen bag of uh, peppers and onions dehydrated. So that's an entire you know bag started out what probably that big, um, and it dehydrates down to that. So you just kind of have to keep that in mind that it doesn't take much of this uh, to make one portion because this is in fact an entire freezer bag full of like you'd buy in the grocery store. Okay, great question though. Okay, let me jump back into uh, here. Okay, so the other basic approach to doing this is to simply dehydrate the full meal. In other words, cook it the way you would cook it at home and then just dehydrate the whole freaking thing. So you just follow your own recipe or whatever your favorite recipe is and just dehydrate it all at once. So what you see pictured here is uh, a picante uh, chicken chili recipe. Uh, it's not a particularly backpacking recipe at all. It simply came off of the website, All Recipes. And it's got uh, chicken and beans and picante sauce and some other things in it. Um, and you can see it just cooked that just like I, I would at home and then dehydrate it and ends up in this uh, kind of crunchy little chunks like this. You do wanna be a little bit careful to uh, make any adjustments necessary uh, because you know that you're gonna be rehydrating this. So for example, the recipe might call for chunks of chicken or even chicken pieces or something like that. Well, what I did is I shredded the chicken as finely as I could when I cooked it, just knowing that that means it's gonna rehydrate better. 
if, uh, if the recipe calls for ground meats, I would use the ground meat with breadcrumb approach and just use that in the recipe. That way you know that it's gonna rehydrate better. Um, a lot of these I've found uh, actually work better in the uh, cook in the pot method. They just take a little longer to rehydrate. I'm not sure why that is. Maybe it's all the different ingredients in it. Um, so I, I have more success with these, with the uh, cook it in the pot. But um, if, if you're careful and do it the right way, again, with ground meats or whatever, uh, you could probably do this with freezer bag as well, okay? All right. Just uh, some quick comments on um, storing. Um, if you if you vacuum seal and store it in your freezer, dehydrated foods will essentially keep forever. Um, now, I I personally don't go to that length. Uh, I don't want to own a vacuum sealer. Um, but I find that um, I really don't don't need it. Things still keep far longer than I would before I use them, right? I use them up before they spoil in any way. Um, vacuum sealer does prevent freezer burn, but I haven't really had much problem with that. It is dehydrated food and freezer burn really is uh, generally related to liquid. So I don't really find that that's necessary. Um, an airtight jar is a is a good option. I find that Ziploc bags actually work pretty well. They're far from being airtight, um, but they actually work pretty well if the food is you know well dried out. Um, you might want to put the Ziplocs into a jar or a Tupperware container or something. And uh, a lot of things I do keep in the freezer. Um, kind of depends on how much room I have in the freezer. Uh, or I just keep it in the refrigerator. And again, I've never had much problem, I've never had any problem, honestly, with things uh, getting bad before uh, before their time, before I use them up. So, uh, but you do want to store it, you know, airtight as you can, cool, um, dark, you know, that, all those kinds of things to uh, facilitate storage. Okay, so we're gonna do a, a quick, uh, we're gonna attempt to do a quick video here. So today we're going to cook some breakfast tacos with ingredients that we dehydrated at home. So let's get started. So here are our ingredients for the uh, breakfast tacos, this, this entire meal. Uh, with everything weighs a little under six ounces. Um, that's including these tortillas, which of course are probably half that weight. But what we've got in here is some dehydrated raw eggs and um, also a mix of chorizo and some salsa, black beans and some uh, taco seasoning and the tortillas, of course, and then a little bit of taco sauce. So uh, just a reminder that uh, I have a couple of choices for doing eggs. Uh, these are re -dehydra raw dehydrated eggs, and uh, so they absolutely have to be cooked uh, on the trail. Uh, we could use uh, these uh, eggs and polenta mixture. These are pre-cooked, and actually all we would have to do is add hot water um, to these ingredients and uh, let them stand for 10 or 15 minutes and we would also could make these uh, breakfast tacos but today we're gonna do, we're gonna do it with the uh, raw dehydrated eggs that uh, we made at home so we've got some hot water here that um, it's already been uh, brought to a boil and we're just gonna add it to these ingredients and let them uh, let them rehydrate for a little while. So I, I don't really measure this. I'm just going to add it until it, uh, until it looks about right. So seal that back up. Mix it up a little bit. Okay. So that little 
thicken up a little bit. And then we'll uh, do the same thing with our chorizo salsa black bean mixture. Just kind of put enough water in there to cover it. So what I'll usually do on the trail if I have something like this, I'll, uh, I'll rehydrate it and then uh, give it 10 or 15 minutes while I'm having my first cup of coffee or you know taking care of some other other business uh, before I get started with with breakfast. As I mentioned, uh, raw dehydrated eggs really need to be cooked on the trail. And uh, what I'm going to use is one of my favorite uh, pans. Uh, doesn't qualify as ultra light, but still, it's about the most lightweight fry pan that I've been able to find. This is uh, MSR's product. It, it weighs under six ounces. And uh, as long as you understand that, you know, it's made of really thin aluminum, so uh, there's going to be hot spots. It's just the nature of having really thin metal cookware. Um, to me, it, it just works great. And again, it's pretty lightweight. I like to uh, heat up the tortillas a little bit too before, uh, before I do the egg mixture and just set this aside. And uh, like I said, this, this pan is really lightweight, so it's important to kind of just keep the, uh, the heat moving around there. But it'll do a nice job of you know, heating up that tortilla. Okay, it's been, uh, it's been about 10 minutes now, so you can see that the uh, eggs are pretty well rehydrated. They look, look a lot like uh, scrambled eggs in texture. And, uh, and uh, this is our chorizo bean salsa kind of mixture. So we're going to add a little bit of um, oil to our pan here. Now remember, um, this is already cooked, so really all we're doing is kind of heating up this mixture, uh, maybe cooking off any of the excess um, liquid. Really, all we're doing is kind of heating that up. Okay, now we can add in our egg mixture. Keeping that pan moving around as need be to keep everything cooking. Uh, this is about two eggs. This is two tablespoons. And we want to get that pretty well cooked. Edges done here. As you can see, this made a couple of good sized tacos here. And uh, now, if you're willing to carry a little bit of extra weight, there's all sorts of things you could obviously add to this meal uh, fresh kinds of things. Uh, 
fresh diced tomatoes are great. Uh, avocado is great. Um, it all depends on you know how much weight you're willing to carry, and then uh, whether or not you're going to eat this meal early enough that you don't have to worry about it. Uh, I personally like a little bit of uh, feta cheese on it. Uh, I'm going to add that in you know, if I'm typically going to eat this meal within a you know a day or two of hitting the trail. Then cheese keeps flying. Uh, you can, if you're concerned about that, you could use a a dried, uh, you know, a Parmesan or a Romano or, or anything else like that. We're going to throw our uh, taco sauce on there, give it a little kick. So there you have it, a uh, pretty good uh, breakfast meal here. Uh, kind of be the envy of uh, all the folks sitting around with you that are having, uh, I don't know, a trail bar or cold granola or instant oatmeal. So, hope you enjoyed it. Pretty good. Okay. Uh, whoops. Get back here. So, um, let's keep going. Denise, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Okay. Um, so I mentioned some of the resources that um, uh, are available where some of these recipes came from. I got uh, Backpacking Chef. Uh, it's a website that uh, excellent uh, material out there. Uh, Trail That Recipes, another one is specifically designed for backpackers. Uh, one of my favorite books is called Recipes for Adventure by uh, Chef Glenn McAllister. And then, like I said before, just any recipe website that uh, you can think of, like uh, all recipes. So, uh, Denise, you want to take us through uh, yep. the poll? Now we'd like to know what you think about how we did. So how many new ideas or surprises did you get from today's presentation? And please type any key takeaways for you in the chat box. Because I see that Jim has a question and we'll answer questions in just a minute or two. Yeah, we will. Uh, we'll open up the phones here in just a second and uh, answer any questions. If you want to throw them in the chat, you can do that as well while people are doing this. Well, we did pretty good. They got okay. Oh, five got hours had a good handle on this, so awesome. Yep, a few new ideas. Good. New ideas. All right, appreciate that feedback. Um, and Denise. Okay. While you're completing this last poll, I'll mention again that we will post a PDF copy of this presentation on the Sierra Club website. Within a few days, we'll also post a link on the same page to a recording of this webinar, along with responses to any questions we didn't answer for today. Our last webinar, our 20th of the year, will be in two weeks on Freezer Bay Cookie, a great follow-up to the session, so don't mess it, miss it. I believe it's uh, November 15th. We'll have a live Q&A at the end of this presentation, and we'll unmute you so that you can ask your questions live. While you are thinking about your questions, I want to let you know that we that we will host a few more webinars next year, and then we'll take a break for the holiday over December. We'll start up again with some new topics in January and February. If there's a particular topic you'd be interested in, please use the chat box to let us know that as well. Next March, we'll begin the series again, so if you missed any of our earlier sessions, you'll have the chance to fill in some blanks. If you love the outdoors as much as we do, we'd love to have you join us, exploring, enjoying, and protecting the planet. Some easy ways to do this are become a Sierra Club member, make a donation, join our meetup group, or become a volunteer. We'll place a link in the chat box to the page with a PDF copy of this presentation. You can download that too to access these links. 
And if you would like to become an audience leader, leader, and lastly, if you already are already an experienced outdoor person with skills to share, we would love to have you join us on the outings committee. If you're looking for outings leader, leaders who have a passion for sharing their experiences with others. Right now we are doing this virtually through our webinar series, but someday we'll be back out on the trails and waterways in person again. The outings committee has lots of fun. Consider joining us. Um, this presentation has been brought to you by Roads, Rivers, and Trails, our local independently owned outdoor outfitter in Milford, Ohio, by the Miami Group Sierra Club, a part of the country's largest grassroots environmental movement, and by Summit Trek and Travel, your connection for adventure travel. We will begin our live Q&A in just a moment, but for those who have to log off now, it's been great to be there with you, and we look forward to seeing you in two weeks. So now we'll go ahead and thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Barry is posting the, the right now for the, uh, if you'd like to contact the outings committee. Yep. All right. Hey, thanks everyone and have a great evening.